Red. Red. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I don't like talking through this, but I will. <laughs> um, as we gather here tonight to hear Jeff, uh, there's a few matters of business, very few that we want to talk about. One of them um, is your dues, and if you see that they're past due, please see the treasure back there, Jim. And also the, his, uh, the high school award. Uh, we give a, an award to a high school senior every year. We have a special Lori Duncan Award Fund that uh, we take contributions to, and we would especially like it if anybody made an extra donation just to that. So uh, if that's something you think you could do, please see Jim with that also. Um, now, between this meeting and our next meeting, we're going to have the tavern tour, which is through with Will Tatum, uh, the Dutchess County historian, and uh, actually the tourism for Dutchess County. We're having it at the winery, oh. and because we have are the biggest draw in Dutchess County for this event, and we've had a too big a crowd for anywhere we've been so far. <laughs> and so we're hoping that that's a big enough space for us. It will be April 12th. The doors will open at 5.30, and you can go up and look at, see the winery, tour it around, and also buy a glass of wine. There will be some cheese and crackers out and things like that. And then at 6.30, there will be a program, and then after the program, we're going to have a buffet dinner. Uh, the buffet dinner will consist of two different entrees, uh, salmon and a chicken dish, and then there'll be, well, let's see, uh, I haven't got the whole menu with me, but there'll be th three or four other things on the buffet thing plus dessert. Uh, wine will be separate, and that will be $7 a glass at, at the open bar. Anybody that buys a bottle of wine that night will also 20% of that will go to the Millbrook Historical Society. And uh, the cost for the whole thing, including the reservations through Will Tatum, will be $30. And that includes your dinner, your hors d'oeuvres, and your, um, the program. Okay? Uh, you can sign up, not through us, not through the Hist Millbrook Historical Society. You either sign up through Meetup online or by calling Will Tatum's office. And we'll have that phone number uh, in the next newsletter so that people can call. Okay? I don't have it right with me. Or you can go to duchesscounty.com or whatever it is and look it up and you call from there. All right? Any questions? On that event? Okay. Uh, anything else anybody wants to bring up? Anybody? You know what? Um, uh, again, if I'll have these out here, the program cards for the year. And again, as last month, if anyone would like to take a little stack and put them someplace, any place in Dutchess County in a public place for people to pick up, we welcome you to do that. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Irvine. He's been here before. He's from the FDR Library and is going to do another fantastic talk on the history of the Roosevelts and especially Eleanor here in Millbrook. Okay, thank you very much. Um, make sure you pay your dues because I saw the treasurer going like this back there when she was making that announcement. So. 
you don't you don't want to uh, you know you don't want to run afoul of that. So um, thank you for having me. I'm back. I'm delighted to, to be back here again. And um, I'm going to leave over here a little packet of wildflower seeds. And this has got some information about um, the Roosevelt Library supports the Think Differently initiative that we're doing here in um, in Dutchess County. And the idea is we're trying to make the library and museum more accessible to people with um, disabilities or with challenges, whether it be hearing challenges, sight challenges, mobility challenges. Um, and we have um, special days uh, four times a year where we turn down the, the lighting and we turn down the sound. Um, so people with sensitivity issues, you know, hearing sensitivity issues can go and, um, and enjoy the, uh, the museum there as well. So I'm going to leave those over there. Um, feel free to take them, plant the flowers, and what we're doing is we're um, planting the seeds of inclusion. So uh, feel free to take some of those. So um, I'm delighted to, to be here, as I said. Um, it turns out your, your big wing ding event that she was just talking about takes place on April 12th which is FDR's death day. <clears throat> yeah, I don't mean to bring you down. All right, so while you're partying, just keep, keep that in mind. Um, but you could also, there you go, he would love that. He would love that. So you can think of it as being FDR's death day or Harry Truman's coming to power day, okay? So, you know, one thing leads to the, to the other. Now tonight, um, what I want to do is share some information with you about um, Mrs. Roosevelt. Last time I was here, I talked sort of about how her life uh, had gone on and some things that um, had influenced her uh, growing up. And tonight what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about her legacy and some of the tools that she used to create that legacy. And then um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about Mrs. Roosevelt uh, here in, in Millbrook. And I want to ask your help for that. That's going to be kind of an interactive um, uh, part of the evening. And I have an opportunity that I'd like to throw out to the historical um, uh, association. When I was preparing for this talk, um, I went into our archives and I discovered that we don't have a whole lot of material about Mrs. Roosevelt out here in, in Millbrook. And um, as a matter of fact, we've got about one box, uh, one box of, of documents that relate to her and her work out here in, in Millbrook. And um, there were only four My Day columns that mentioned Millbrook. Uh, in her, uh, in all of the My Day columns that she had done, and she did them for 26 years, every day except for Sunday. So what I've decided to do, <clears throat> and I throw this out to the Historical Association if you'd like to um, take advantage of this, I've arranged for an intern uh, with Marist College and a videographer, um, and what I'd like to do is get um, the, the folks here in the village that know or met or have a story to tell about Mrs. Roosevelt. Um, I'd like to get them together with that intern, get them together with that um, the videographer, and capture those stories. Capture those stories before they're gone. Because Mrs. Roosevelt, you know, in her collections, and we have three million pages of Mrs. Roosevelt's papers, and I went through, not all three million, but I went through many, many. Um, I assigned an intern to go through them as well. I did the online search. And what I discovered was that most of the material that she had in her collection related to the Millbrook School out here, and um, you know her work with the uh, with the Millbrook School. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about um, in a couple of minutes. But I thought you know it, it put me in mind of, th of thinking, wow, you know, here we are, this this um, you know this archive, and we've got material about Mrs. Roosevelt from all over the world, but we don't have a lot of material about her and our interactions with ordinary people here in the valley. And ordinary people is what she was all about. You know, rank and file, everyday, ordinary folks. And that is one of the biggest part of, parts of her legacy, is that she allowed ordinary people to become part of the system, to become part of the process. And, you know, she met with all kinds of kings and queens and ambassadors and all kinds of fancy folks like that. But, she drew strength and, um, and a sense of fulfillment by um, meeting with regular folks and talking about them with their problems, hearing about what they had to say, and then um, trying to help them do something about that. So if that's something you guys are interested in, I'd like to use Millbrook as a jumping off point, as a model. Um, and as, as I say, I've already talked to Marist College about it. Uh, we've got the video guide through the end of the summer, so we can set up the arrangements to do these kinds of things. And, you know, kind of like tell us your Roosevelt story. 
and we'll use this as a model here first in Millbrook, and then we can use this as a model to go to places like Wappingers and Hughesonville and you know um, Ellenville and all those kinds of places. So once again, the people of Millbrook will be pioneers in um, you know in getting and getting stuff done. Um, so as we all know, Eleanor Roosevelt was first lady of the United States for 13 years, and um, during that 13 years, she had a very close relationship with the president. Now, a lot's been made over the fact that they had an affair and it wasn't the lovey-dovey marriage anymore that, you know, it had been uh, in the early years. But it was a partnership. And it was a political partnership that was based upon trust and mutual admiration and respect. And there was still love there. It wasn't the lovey-dovey kind of love, but there was a love there that, that never really died uh, in either one of them. And so when Mrs. Roosevelt <clears throat> was looking to... Um, to get things done, she had the ear of the president. Not just the ear of the president, but the ear of the president who had the presidency for 13 long years. And what you're going to see uh, more and more in the next um, coming years is more and more research and more and more information about Mrs. Roosevelt and how important she was to um, FDR in, during the war, during uh, the Great Depression and the creation of the New Deal, and also through his various campaigns. So you're going to see more and more of Mrs. Roosevelt material coming out. So she was first lady for 13 years, and then he dies, and she says, okay, well, the story's over. You know, I'm going to go back to Hyde Park and, you know, Val Kill and just sort of, you know, retire and, you know, you know do, you know, grandma type things, you know. Um, and that lasted about a week. Um, and then she, uh, she got right back into things. And she continued to have a 17-year career after she left the White House as what Harry Truman called First Lady of the World. All right, And First Lady of the World, meaning that she had the kind of respect, she had the name recognition, she had the ability to reach people not just here in the Hudson Valley, not just here in the state of New York, not just here in the United States, but all over the world. And if you travel other places, and you mentioned Mrs. Roosevelt, you'll find that she's got probably, in many ways, in many places, more respect for her in other places in the world than um, right here in our, in our own country. And she, like FDR, always returned here to the Hudson Valley to where her roots were. Now, his roots were much deeper here because um, you know, he had a very happy upbringing and a you know, happy childhood here uh, at the home in Hyde Park. Hers was a little dicier, as we talked about last time out. But she still um, considered this to be home. And when she retired, she had a home in, in New York City, and she had a home up here, and she split her time um, back and forth um, from those places. So how did she accomplish? Yes. Can I say something? Yes. The last time we were here was to a different group. Oh. It wasn't to this group. It was to the um. home of group over the restaurant. That's good to know. <laughs> That's very good to know. That's good. Okay. All right. Well, I don't have to worry about. I don't have to worry about repeating myself. All right. So let me back up a little bit. Um, Mrs. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, had a really bad upbringing. She had a very unhappy childhood. Um, her mother called her Granny because she thought she looked like a little old lady. Her father was a neglective alcoholic. Took her into New York one time. Put her on a stoop. Went into a bar. Got plastered went out the back door in a cab, was sent home, and little Eleanor stayed out there for almost two hours waiting for her father to, to come out. Um, by the time she was 10 years old, both of her parents had passed away. She was bounced around from Roosevelt family member to Roosevelt family member, eventually ending up in, in Tivoli uh, with her grandma Hall, who was a very strict disciplinarian. And Granny Hall would, you know, if, you, if, you ask, if she asked you to set the table and you put the fork or the knife in the wrong spot, that could, um, you know, that could spark a, a three-day cold shoulder, you know, she just wouldn't talk to you for three days, you know. Um, and so she had a kind of a rough, a rough gig, and she also had two alcoholic uncles that lived there, and they would shoot at her from the attic windows while she was on the, the property. So if she were out tending her horse, they might shoot the bale of hay next to the horse. Or if she was at the, parting, uh, the, the potting barn, they might shoot at the pot, the pot that she had just planted um, just to see her jump. Well, her grandma said, this is not a good gig, and so we've got to get this kid out of here. So they send her over to Allenwood School, and there she sees and meets um, Madame Silvestri. And Madame Silvestri is the head of Allenwood School, 
And she sees in Eleanor Roosevelt the kinds of things that the rest of the world is going to see later on. And it's uh, at Allen Wood School that she learns to stand up for herself. She learns to talk about the issues that are important to her. She learns to express her ideas. She learns to um, craft her arguments. And more importantly, she learns to stand her ground and defend her arguments. And these are the tools that um, she then develops um, to, to go on and become the Eleanor Roosevelt that we all know and love. Now, how did she accomplish uh, her work? Well, she accomplished it um, by using four key tools. And the first of these is called moral construct. So Mrs. Roosevelt, having grown up in a political family, Uncle Teddy was president, uh, her husband was a state senator, governor, um, and president, she understood, um, she understood politics. And she understood that it was all a game of horse trading. And that it was all a game of, of, you know, of, of push and shove and give and take. And she didn't like that, because if she felt that something had to be done, or ought to be done, she felt that it should be done. And so she would craft her arguments in what, what are called moral constructs. So let's say um, the argument was, we want to provide school lunches for kids, right? And if you say that to a group, you know, a legislature or something like that, they're going to say, well, how are we going to pay for that? Where are we going to find the money for that? How are we going to do the insurance on that? Who's going to take care of it? How are we going to, you know, and there's, they throw up a thousand different um, examples and reasons why it can't be done. But Mrs. Roosevelt would use this little trick, and before she got into, you know, talking about what it is that she wanted to do, she would back the argument down to a simple yes or no question. Don't kids that go to school every day deserve to have a good lunch so they're not hungry and they can learn better? Right? And I see heads are shaking, right? Good, that makes us partners. Now, how do we do it? And she could then um, begin to put the, you know, put the heat, you know, the feet to the fire, so to speak, um, in terms of getting people to help her. Because if they said, well, you know, it would be great to do that, but it's going to be too expensive. But you just agreed with me that it has to be done. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I guess. Well, then how are we going to do that? And it kept people from getting away from her. It kept people from turning the argument um, away from her. And so um, by creating these moral constructs, getting things down to a yes or no question, um, then sort of entrap these people to become her, her partners and her allies in what it was that had to be done. Yes, we're going to deal with insurance, we're going to deal with, you know, distribution, we're going to deal with who's going to finance it, who's going to, you know, man the booth and all that sort of stuff. But we'll do that later. You and I have an agreement which is these kids need these lunches, or these people need these houses, or these roads need to be built, or whatever it is. So she's got you in a moral construct. Another technique she used um, was a thing called personification. And personification is um, a method where you use an actual person as opposed to a statistic. So the government, you know, in the 1920s and 30s was generating all these, uh, you know, statistics. Well, 28% of this and 92% of that and 46% of this and that. And people's eyes glaze over. Mm -hmm. So when Mrs. Roosevelt would talk about the trouble that farmers were having, she wouldn't talk about the fact that 36% of the farms went under in a, in a given year. She would bring in Old MacDonald and his family. Mm -hmm. right? And here is Old MacDonald, and he's standing there with the worry lines on his face and you know the hurt in his eyes and the hopelessness in his eyes and here's his wife and here are their three children and these are the people we have to help not 36 percent of farmers these people right here and when you're looking somebody in the eye it's a lot harder to say no when you're looking somebody in the eye it's a lot harder to turn away and when you're looking somebody in the eye, you have that human connection, which was so important for Mrs. Roosevelt. She understood, yeah, yeah, you know, the economists are going to have to get it down to the numbers, but I want to get it down to the people. And this is a, a technique that you see a lot, um, especially these days, with the State of the Union addresses. Mm -hmm. Right? So the president's up there, you know, whoever it is, I'm not mentioning any names, but whoever it is, they get up there and say, oh, you know, fireman of the week, or, you know, and then here's the fireman of the week. You know, and here's the student of the week, and here's all these people, and they look just like the people who live down the street from you. Because those are the people that Mrs. Roosevelt was trying to reach, the average, um, the average person. She also used a technique, so she used these moral constructs, yes or no questions, personification, bring the actual real life person in, 
And she also used this technique called associative circles. And what that is, is that Mrs. Roosevelt was a joiner. Um, just to give you a, a, a brief list of some of the organizations she belonged to, she was on the United Nations Human Rights Commission, the NAACP, the National Youth Administration, the American Youth Congress, the American Student Union, right? always with young people, right, because she understood that was the future. Um, the WPA Arts and Writers Project, the Conference on um, the Emerging Needs of Women, New York State um, Women's Democratic Committee, the League of Women Voters, the Junior League, Consumers League, Red Cross, Valkyl Industries, Todd Hunter School, and the list goes on and on. Mrs. Roosevelt was a joiner. And when she joined an organization, she wasn't like some people when they join organizations. You ever notice when you're in an organization, there's 40 members and there's like eight people that do everything? Okay? She was two of those eight people. Right? That's how active she was. Right? That's how active she was. So when she joined an organization, she got involved. And, you know, if she was going to join, she was going to be an active member. She was going to pay her dues. She was going to come to the meetings. She was going to um, introduce ideas into the, you know, into the committees and such. And, more importantly, she would go and then blab about what she was doing at one organization to another organization. Right? This idea of associative circles. So she was kind of like a butterfly. And she would go to the meeting, oh, I'm not, you know, tonight I'm at the Millbrook Historical Association, and tomorrow I'm going to be at a breakfast of governors. And when she's there, she'll talk about you guys. Hey, you know who I met last night? This historical association, you know, they've got a scholarship for outstanding students, and that might be something you might want to contribute to, right? Don't you think students should have enough money to go to school? Right? There's, there's the, uh, okay, the, the moral construct. Well, yes, they should, Mrs. Roosevelt. Good, I'm glad you're going to help him. I, 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 right? So she was like a butterfly, and she cross-pollinated, and she brought people together, and she didn't believe that there should be barriers and walls and communication barriers between people, but she wanted people to talk, because she understood that the problems that you guys are facing in your organization are going to be very similar to the ones you guys are facing in your organization, and you folks are facing in yours. So rather than reinvent the wheel, let's pool our resources. Let's pull together and get something done. So this idea of associative circles. And they tell a story about how when Mrs. Roosevelt, you know, she didn't really like alcohol because she had alcoholism in her family. Um, and so on, on New Year's Eve, when it came time to toast the new year, she would work right up until about 10 minutes before New Year's. And then, you know, she would, you know, visit with her guests and people that were at the house. And then she'd have a quick toast and back to work. Okay, because she couldn't afford to waste that time. You know, she had grown up as a child, as a young woman, on the outside looking in. She was a Roosevelt even before she was a Roosevelt, right? Because she was Teddy Roosevelt's niece. So she didn't need Franklin Roosevelt. She had access to the Roosevelt family fortune, the Roosevelt name, the Roosevelt connections. He only helped her in that, you know, and added more from his side of the family. So she was a Roosevelt before she was a Roosevelt, and she could very easily have lived the good life and just, you know, done her own thing. But she chose instead to help other people. And because she, and the reason was because she knew what it was like to be on the outside looking in. So when she helped people of color, or workers, or children, or students, or immigrants, or refugees, or the list goes on and on and on, she helped them because she knew what it was like not to have a place at the table, not to have a voice in the discussion and in the argument. And she felt most comfortable when she was making somebody else's voice heard through herself. And that's when she, um, she felt the most, uh, most satisfied. And the way she did that was through total media involvement. All right? If Mrs. Roosevelt was to, alive today, she'd be a Kardashian. <laughs> right? She'd be everywhere. Because she was everywhere back then. She had a My Day column that she wrote every day for 26 years except Sunday. Wow. Some people call it the world's first blog. You know how the kids blog, oh, I'm having toast today, oh, I'm having toast today too. Okay, I'm going to go to the mall, hey, I'm going to go to the mall. Right? And they, they go back and forth with that. Um, that's what Mrs. Roosevelt was doing with her My Day columns. Hey, I went into Poughkeepsie today and they've got some beautiful beefsteak tomatoes at the farmer's market. You know, you got to go get some of those. Those are awesome. And then the next day, oh, met with the queen. 
<laughs> you know, so it went all over the place. But it gave people a sense of what she was doing. And it gave people a sense that they, who were on the outside, were looking inside. The very first My Day column um, that she wrote was about President Roosevelt going upstairs because he had a bit of a cold. And um, he had gone to bed early, and she was, um, you know, just writing, uh, saying, you know, here's what's going on tonight. You know, the president went to bed early, he doesn't feel so good. Um, you know, he's got the sniffles, and tomorrow he's got to do this and this and this, and so that's why he's resting up. And while he does that, I'm going to do a little knitting, but I thought I'd write to you a little bit about what's going on here in the White House. Mm -hmm. Bringing people in, okay? bringing folks in. So she wrote her My Day columns. She also wrote 24 books. Good. All right. I just finished my first book, actually, um, and I enjoyed it so much I might actually read another one. Um, um, but she wrote 24 books, and these books were about all kinds of topics. Everything from etiquette and manners, what you ought to do, what you ought not to do, you know, out in good society. Uh, she wrote books about uh, international diplomacy. She wrote books about education. She wrote books about marriage. She wrote books about, um, you know, travel. You name it, she wrote books about it. And um, she, you have to remember, only went to the equivalent of high school. She never went to college. Allenwood School was, it was a boarding school um, that was the equivalent of going to high school. So when she wrote, she didn't feel like, well, you know, I, you know, I don't really know. Because, you know how like, when you write stuff, you know, like you don't know, do I use a, a colon, right, a semicolon, an esophagus, you know, whatever it is, right? Uh, what do you put out there, right? So she'd scratch her head, and she always felt like uncomfortable doing that, you know. But she felt she had to say something. She had something to say, so she wasn't going to let that get in her way. She also did radio. She was on the radio, on radio shows. Um, and, you know, that wasn't easy for her either because she knew she had that high, squeaky, Eleanor Roosevelt voice which grates on people. And there would always be dogs outside the studio uh, scratching to get out. Um, but, uh, right? So she had that high, squeaky voice. But that high, squeaky voice had a message to deliver. It had a message to give. And, um, she would she would uh, use that. As a matter of fact, people don't know this, but you know everybody's familiar with the famous, um, you know, yesterday, December seventh, right, uh -huh. the date that will live in infamy, when the president addressed the country about the attack at Pearl Harbor. Mrs. Roosevelt addressed the country first. Yes, yeah. on Sunday night. That's right. Yeah. On that Sunday night, the attack occurred on a Sunday. That Sunday night, she was supposed to go on the radio and talk about her Christmas shopping because we were still in the throes of the Great Depression. The idea was to gin up some, you know, some support. Hey, if you can get out there and buy something, buy something. It's good for everybody, right? And she was going to talk about her Christmas shopping. It's three weeks out from Christmas. And she takes that script and she throws it out and she keeps the radio show and she says, tonight as I talk to you, down the hall, the president is meeting with members of Congress, members of the military, and, you know, leaders from the Allies. And they're trying to figure out what happened. You know, we, something happened today. We don't really know what it was. You know, they knew there was an attack, but they didn't know how widespread or, you know, the whole casualties and all that. So as I'm talking to you, he's down the hall doing that. And there's a tension in the White House tonight. And he's going to address this. I know there's a tension in the country. He's going to address this tomorrow. So I ask you just to, you know, stay calm, relax. You know, everybody be cool. And tomorrow the president's going to talk to you about this. So she took to the airwaves first and calm the country, you know, even before he did. He gets all the credit, you know, dang, that will live in infamy, right? Mm -hmm. What about a radio show that, you know, should be, um, you know, more, uh, more talked about? She also did television. Yeah. And that wasn't easy for her either, because she, you know, everybody's always pointing out how unattractive she was, right? Um, and so, you know, she didn't really have a, a television face, you know, she wasn't, you know, beautiful on the outside. She was beautiful on the inside, where it matters the most. But she had these, these um, television shows, and she would do, um, she would talk about uh, national and international issues uh, on these, these television shows. She also did commercials, and she always put in her contract for commercials that she had the right to, um, to make political commentary if she chose to do it. And there was one particular uh, uh, commercial she did for margarine. And it only ran like once or twice. 
because it went something like this. You know, oh, look at this margarine. Isn't it wonderful? See how easily it spreads across the bread. <laughs> Speaking of spreading, nuclear weapons are spreading around this world. And we need to do something about it. Or this world can... Gonna... Right? So, okay. Didn't sell a whole lot of margarine. <laughs> okay. But she felt she had to do it. Now, the other thing I'd like you to understand is none of this was easy for her. Okay, none of this was easy for her. She didn't feel she had writing skills. She didn't feel she had a good public speaking voice. She didn't feel she had an attractive face to be out there, you know, um, pushing these issues and, and, and making these things through. But she felt she had to do it. And she was afraid every step of the way. She, because she never had that confidence. She never had that, that sense of, 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 um, of self-awareness that, you know, she knew what she was talking about or that, you know, she had a right to the opinion. Um, Madame Silvestri helped to bring that out, but she never really fully felt comfortable with that. Unlike Franklin, who would talk about anything, anytime, anywhere, to anybody, uh, and feel good about it, whether he knew anything about it or not, um, she didn't have that. So she felt that she had to be the voice um, for these other people, and she felt that she had to be um, there to, to help and support them. And, you know, of course, she goes and she works at the United Nations, um, Harry Truman uh, appoints her to be um, on the American delegation uh, to the United Nations. And it was here in Millbrook that she gave a talk to the Millbrook School uh, students about the United Nations. So she felt that young people needed to be aware of what was going on in the world and they needed to be um, brought into the discussion. Because after all, they were the ones that were going to have to do the heavy lifting when the rest of us were gone. So um, the Millbrook School here in, in Millbrook, um, President Roosevelt, when he was governor, was very instrumental in helping to get that started um, and get it off the ground with uh, Edward Pulling. And um, their grandson, uh, Franklin Eleanor Roosevelt's grandson, Haven, attended the school um, and eventually graduated uh, from the school. When Haven was going to school here, he uh, volunteered Eleanor Roosevelt to give the graduation speech. He said, oh, you know what, uh, when it comes time for graduation, I'll have my grandmother come and do it. Wouldn't that be great? And so, um, right? So uh, he invites her to do this, and the headmaster, uh, Edward Pulling, has to uninvite her. Oh, no. Now imagine that, uninviting Eleanor Roosevelt to give the graduation speech. And the reason was because traditionally the speech had been given by a member of the clergy. And she was not a member of the clergy. Right? She was a saint, but not a member uh, of the clergy. So um, we have in our collection a very delicately worded um, uh, uninvitation, un let's say, uh, of Mrs. Roosevelt to, to come speak out here. Um, she gave uh, a great deal of attention to the Millbrook School, even before um, her family members uh, had come out here because she believed that the school was, um, was not only high in academic standards but also high in creating um, civic understanding and involvement, you know, which was very, very important to her. And so um, she comes out here in April of 1949 and she gives a speech about the United Nations and the work that she was doing there, the importance of the United Nations, and she's telling the students how important it is that they have, they have to support the United Nations, that they have to get involved, that you know, the, the future of the world depends upon them. And she talks about the fact that, um, you know, that it needs to be supported. And she talks about the fact that there's a need for education, so that the things that these kids, you know, you kids are learning in classes, really does apply out there to the real world. And you have to get the best education because she understood that the world was changing so quickly. Television was coming in. Jet, uh, you know, transportation, the jet age was coming in. Rockets were coming in. The world was changing and you had to keep up. And she knew that education was very important for that. And she also understood and spoke with the children about, or the students, about the need to counter Russia. You know, she understood that, um, you know, that, that Russia, you know, the Cold War was going on at this time, was the big, um, the big battle that she was going to have to, uh, you know, that, that we were going to have to, to face. And that if we didn't do that, and if we didn't support um, the government, and if we didn't support democracy, and if we didn't support what the, uh, the Allies and the United Nations was doing, um, then we were going to end up in a bigger conflict, um, and they were going to possibly win. 
Okay, not the war of wars, but the war of ideology. So she understood how important that was. Um, she also developed, uh, was very supportive of a farm that was being developed out here at the Millbrook School. And she understood how important that was because she understood and believed that the, um, the skills of a farmer were very important for people to have. Now today, you know, we're so far removed, you know, the only farming we do is maybe we go to the farm market, right? That's as close to a farm as we get. But back in those days, you know, um, in the you know, 40s and 50s, people were beginning to move out of farms, away from farms. But she understood how important farm life was, the idea of hard work, the idea that everybody had a purpose on the farm, the idea that you couldn't let things go too long, right? You don't milk that cow, she's going to go dry. You don't get the eggs out from under the chickens, they're going to they're crack them. Um, she understood that you had to have patience, that you plant the seeds, and then you wait and you nurture the field, and you, you, know, you water the field, and you weed the field, and you keep the rodents and the animals and things out of the field, and then you get a harvest. And she felt that that was a great metaphor for life, right? You know, you plant the seeds, you know, whether it's your education, whether it's the United Nations, and the harvest will come later after all of the hard work. So she was instrumental in helping them um, to develop that even helping a guy by, uh, by the name of Mr. Trevor to create the zoo, okay. right? the, the Trevor Zoo. And um, it's interesting because uh, you'd be surprised how well known the Trevor Zoo is. I was going across the country one time on a train and, um, and I was, you know, you talk to people and stuff and, you know, where are you from? Oh, from Dutchess County. Dutchess County, hey, isn't that, there's, there are no brooks out there, right? Don't they have the Trevor Zoo? So this person that I just happened to bump into on a train knew about the Trevor Zoo. Well, how do you know about that? Oh yeah, it's at that school, you know. Um, so they were instrumental in, in helping with that. And she supported the school, um, and she supported it in, in spits and spurts. Sometimes writing a check for $50, other times writing a check for $2,500. You know, just whatever happened to, to uh, apply in. She was very good friends with Edward Poling and, um, and his, uh, his wife, and um, she would have them over for dinner, and um, she would have them over on New Year's uh, Day for an open house. And um, when she spoke here or came out to the school, she had him drive into Hyde Park, pick her up, drive back out here, she would do the speech, have dinner, and then he'd have to drive her home again. Okay, so, um, you know, maybe that was just penance for, you know, uninviting her to the graduation. Um, that, I, that, I don't, that I don't know. Yeah, um, that, that I don't know. So, we have in our collection, uh, and I brought some of the documents here, you know, um, basically the, uh, the My Day columns, and we have also uh, a lot of, um, quite a bit of information about the Millbrook School. But we don't have a lot of, you know, you know, she wasn't the kind of person that would, uh, she didn't really keep a diary. Her diary really was basically the My Day columns, you know. So the intimate relationships that she had with people here in, in the Hudson Valley, Mil whether it's Millbrook or Wappingers or, you know, Hyde Park, um, she didn't splash that around. You know, that was, that was something that wasn't, it wasn't political capital for her. It wasn't something that she was going to use to her advantage other than to get information and to gain insight and to get a sense of what um, people were interested in and, and looking in uh, and looking at and talking about. And so um, as I was researching this and finding fewer and fewer pieces of information, you know, it dawned on me um, how important it is uh, to, to get that information, especially in people who still have a, a first-hand memory of Mrs. Roosevelt um, because they're going, right? It's that simple. Um, and people who have a first you know, hand relationship with her or memory of her uh, are fewer and farther between. But many of you or many of the folks out here may have memories of their parents interacting with her or, you know, her coming to visit the house or the farm or the, the organization. So I, if it's okay with you, I want to work with you on, on getting those things, capturing those things, and getting this intern from Marist to create a model by which this could then be used in other places. We also don't have a lot of documentation about these things, and this is something that, um, that is um, uh, very indicative of the whole organization over there. Um, you know, people come from all over the world 
and all over the country to learn about you know New Deal. So you know, get somebody from Seattle. They'll come. Oh, I want, I'm interested in learning about the sidewalk program out in front of my house in Seattle. You know, what do you got? It's like, well, we've got you know stuff about the WPA, but the stuff you're looking for is probably in Seattle. Okay, it's probably in the local archives. It's probably in your county archive. It could be in your town archive, or it could be in the basement of some local know-it-all. Right? <laughs> Somebody whose uncle worked for the WPA or the CCC, and somehow this stuff, you know, got sent there. So um, that sort of struck me as the same problem that we're having here. You know, we know she was all over the place. You know, we know he was all over the place. Um, but we need to capture those stories. We need to, to capture those um, those stories before it's it's too late. So we're going to do a little thing called "Tell Me Your Roosevelt Story," and we'll um, we'll have the intern who will um, we can get them to schedule the stuff. We can get them to structure the how these things go so they're all kind of you know somewhat uniform. Um, we'll also get them to do some of the research because uh, you know to, to document the stories. So if you say, "Oh, you know, they came to my grandma's farm," you know, was, do you have a picture of that? Well, gee, my grandma might you know. So we'll, we'll begin to do that um, there as well. So those are the tools that Mrs. Roosevelt used. And um, you know she was concerned about little people um, in little places. And she once said that you know human rights, when she's talking about human rights, because she was on the Human Rights Committee uh, at the UN, and she said, you know, human rights begins in small places, places too small to be seen on a map, you know, places like homes, places like schools, places like churches. Places like two people interacting, you know, in the Stewarts right down here on, on Main Street. That's where human rights begin. If we can start being nice to each other here, then that's going to have a ripple effect and people are going to become nicer and nicer um, to folks in, in other places. And what this does is it gives people an opportunity. When we talk to young people, you know, I do like 25,000 students a year uh, who come through our, our education program. And a lot of them, you know, they get all awestruck by President Roosevelt and Mrs. Roosevelt. And how do you make that connection? Well, I try to make it by saying that, you know, Mrs. Roosevelt, um, there were two particular quotes that I like um, from Mrs. Roosevelt. She said, you don't have to become a hero overnight. All right? And what that does is it gives you permission to mess up. Right? It gives you permission to make mistakes. You don't have to become a hero overnight. She didn't. She spent her whole life becoming a hero. She spent her whole life doing better, becoming better, learning more, talking more, expressing more, and, and being more and more active. So if you set a goal for yourself, whether it's a personal goal or a community goal, and you screw up, that's okay. Right? Just try harder the next time. Try harder the next day. You don't have to become a hero overnight. And that's one of the things that we try to get through to the kids because everything's so instant, instant gram and instant potatoes and instant everything these days, right? Um, you know what? It's okay to develop slowly over time. The other thing that Mrs. Roosevelt said is, another favorite quote is, remember, you can't do everything, but you can do something. And you need to start that right where you are. And if you do that, um, that piece by piece, drip by drip, point by point will become um, a more um, momentous and a more moving and a more important and a more dramatic and you know a more accomplished uh, effort as you go on. So Mrs. Roosevelt's legacy was bringing in little people, giving them a voice, sharing their stories, their ideas, their hardships, their struggles, their dreams, their hopes with a government that at that time felt out of touch with the regular people. The regular people felt out of touch with them, uh, with the government as well. So her legacy was really a, a commitment to equality and to justice and to uh, commitment. You know, joining an organization and being part of it. You know, that's what it was all about. It was also to courage, to be um, not afraid you know, uh, you can't afford to be afraid. She thought that being uh, afraid was, was cowardly. You know, that it was, you know, you, didn't, you couldn't have the luxury of that. You know, if there was somebody that was in need and you had a way to fix that, but you were afraid to do it, you were a coward. And you needed to step forward and do what it was that, that you could do. And she said that, you know, um, in the long run, fear 
uh, courage is more exhilarating than fear. All right? And if you, if you begin to build this piece by piece, step by step, you'll begin to, um, to develop that. And most of all, she believed that character counts. You know, that's an important part of her legacy. You look at Mrs. Roosevelt and you can say, well, she was kind of a busybody here, maybe she shouldn't have said that, or maybe she shouldn't have done that. But when you look at the totality of who she was, when you look at the totality of who she inspired, when you look at the totality of what she was able to accomplish, you certainly have to agree she was a woman of character. And character matters, especially in our young people. You know, um, if you're going to say something, you, know, you better keep your word. If you're going to tell people you're going to be there, you better show up. If you're going to make a commitment, you better keep it. You know, if you're going to join something, you have an obligation to that organization. You have an obligation to the other members of the team. You have an obligation to the other members of your family. You have an obligation to the other members of your community. We're all in this together. So commitment, equality, justice, courage, and character. All these things were part of what Mrs. Roosevelt's um, legacy was. And the way that she impacted people, the way she inspired people, the way that, um, you know, that, that we see now the world is, is moving. I mean, you know, there's what, like 19 Democratic women running for, for president, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, um, when Mrs. Roosevelt was born, she couldn't, she couldn't vote, oh, no. right? No. You know, so that happened over the course of her time. And, you know, by getting people involved with these things, by talking about things, by bringing in the folks that are on the outside, and by, by standing up, for you know, courage and justice, and and being a person of character, whether you know whether it's it's popular or not, really counts and really matters. Think about the people in your life, you know, people that inspired you, people that were model role models for you or heroes for you. They were people of character, you know. And so many, and I don't want to sound like I'm preaching here, but so many of our young people don't have that anymore. They don't have people of character, you know. They've got people of of the moment, they've got people, you know, that are able to um, captivate Instagram and all that sort of stuff, and and be kind of a flash in the in the uh, in the pan. But Mrs. Roosevelt died um, in 1962 in, in in New York, and here we are in 2019 in Millbrook, still talking about her, mm -hmm. right? still being inspired by her. So that's the important legacy um, that she has. And we will find out more about um, her intimate um, interactions with people here in Millbrook through this little this little project. If you guys are are, are up for it, game for it. Okay. Any questions, comments, slight remarks? <laughs> You went to the school? I was eight years old and going to school here. Uh -huh. And we used to come up on Fridays to the high school. And they had like a puppet show, a magician, or something, movies, cartoons. Uh -huh. And we walked up to the school and everybody's going, what are, what are we having today? We don't know. So we get in there, and they brought all the kids from all the schools. So the students, you know, the upper class people had the seats. Us kids had to sit on the floor in front of the stage. And we're still buzzing. Is it going to be, what is it, magician, cartoons? Sometimes they had singers, you know, and stuff. And out walks Eleanor Roosevelt with this crazy, squeaky voice. And, of course, I was eight years old, and the kids living with no cartoons. cartoons, right? Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, uh, we spent the whole time in sorrow, not even realizing who she was. I don't even know if we listened to what she said. But anyway, uh, I did this book with Joyce Gee and them, Eleanor yeah. Roosevelt, a woman of the country. Yep, yep. And that's in there. That's I wrote up that thing, and Joyce said, "Do you have a picture of yourself?" And I said, "Yeah." Well, I don't want one of them. I want one of you eight years old. <laughs> and that's in the book. And the, the story about us, even still mad going back to school. Aww. There was no cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, she also... Can, can I just say, thing, sir, it, it's time to get over it. <laughs> 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 we got to move on. 
<laughs> the same book, there's a picture I put in there of Eleanor teaching uh, young black girls from the city swimming down in Burbank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think 22 pictures we gave her from the Poughkeepsie. They were trying to show they didn't want politicians or any political things. They wanted a woman. There was a picture in there we gave her, uh, her milk and a goat at the Dutchess County Fair. And you, you must have seen it. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find copies of it. You know, I want to buy something to give people. But that, yeah. Yeah, um, I, actually, I was looking at that online. There's a little section of it on, on, uh, online. Um, yeah, Joyce was uh, the, the county historian before they had a county historian. Right. You know, um, and, um, and that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great work. And that's the kind of stories that we want to hear. I mean, maybe something a little more uplifting, like she said to me that day, <laughs> and that stuck with me ever since. But, uh, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome, you know. Be, or maybe there's something that was in the Poughkeepsie Journal, because um, when she spoke about the United Nations at the Millbrook School, they put it in their little newsletter, the little school newsletter. There was a reporter that covered that, so we, we have a record of that. I looked for the speech that she actually gave. I, did, I wasn't able to find the speech, but I was able to find the, the synopsis of it that the reporter had done, the student reporter, um, in the... Um, in the Millbrook School uh, um, the newsletter, which is called the Silo, right? You know, based upon on, on the farm and stuff. So that's great. Anybody else have a Roosevelt? An yes. Do you know whether any Roosevelts or relations like uh, Delano's or Livingston's lived in this area? Yes. 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 As, uh, as a matter of fact, was it FDR? Yeah, yeah. yeah. lived in Poquay. Yeah, right yeah. out here. Big farm in Poquay. Well, yeah. also yeah. lived in. Uh, that was him. He moved from Polk yeah. Way to South Road. And his daughter, uh, Nancy Ireland um, Roosevelt, now lives in, in Connecticut, and um, she speaks very fondly of growing up out here um, in, uh, you know, in, in Polk Way. And um, I forget when he died, but it wasn't that long ago. It was like the 80s, I think. It was yeah. in the 80s, and yeah. um, it was a carriaging accident. He was driving. Um, uh, cross-drawn carriage, and it tipped over, and um, he sustained injuries that became, uh, it was when he, he was married to Toby Roosevelt. At the time. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And, and Toby's still stayed. around. Yep, yeah. yep. Um, it's interesting you should say that, because this is, again, uh, this is an Eleanor Roosevelt story. Um, the carriage ride makes me think of it. There's, we have a famous picture in the, in the museum of Mrs. Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy. Because um, he came here in 1960, in August, to, uh, to the Roosevelt Library, and it was the 25th anniversary of Social Security being created, and he gave a speech about that. But the other reason he was in town was to meet with Mrs. Roosevelt, because he happened to be running for president. And he needed basically her endorsement. You know, he had to come and kiss the ring, you know. And so um, they were going to meet at Val Hill, and the night before the meeting, um, one of the Roosevelt grandchildren was upstate at a farm, or I'm sorry, at a camp, um, and was injured in a horseback riding in injury. This is what puts me in mind of that. And um, Mrs. Roosevelt was the closest Roosevelt family member, so, um, you know, she said, oh, I'll run up and see what's going on. So she drives up, and um, over the course of the night, the granddaughter dies. Aww. So she says, well, her mom and dad are en route. There's nothing I can do. I've got to meet with Senator Kennedy in the morning. And she gets back in the car, drives back down to Hyde Park, and there's this picture, you know, Kennedy looks like a million bucks like he always does, and Mrs. Roosevelt somehow looks even frumpier than usual, and it was because she was up all night, you know, with this, this family tragedy. And when he said, when he found out, Kennedy found out, he said, oh, you know, we'll have to meet again some other time, you know, like, you know, please, this is... And she said, no, 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 if you want to be president, we got to meet, and we, i got a couple things I want to talk to you about. And it was at that meeting that she held his feet to the fire to put the um, civil rights um, planks in the Democratic platform for 1960, which did not get passed in, in President Kennedy's lifetime, but Johnson was able to get them through um, at, you know, after that. So it was, um, you know, she was very instrumental in, in getting that, uh, that in. And the, the Kennedys and the, and the Roosevelts weren't always, um, they, they, they were kind of at each other's, they got on each other's nerves. 
So that was a really important meeting to, to have those folks um, you know, come together with that. Did you have a... Yeah. I was just wondering if it was very much written about how she was as a mother, since she didn't have much of an example herself. Right. Uh, if any of her children have written about you know, how it was growing up? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was, um, she actually wrote a book on parenting, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, and, and your point is well taken. She, was not, she did not have a good role model for, uh, for, a, mother, for a mother. Um, her mother was not a particularly good role model or, um, or loving, you know, uh, her mother was a big socialite in New York and she, you know, expected her children to be that and Eleanor was kind of the ugly duckling. Um, and so she never really had a good <clears throat> uh, parental role model. Um, and then Madame Silvestri was really more of a mentor than a mother. And so when she married Franklin, this is where a lot of the, the conflict between um, Sarah and Eleanor came from. When she married Franklin, she kind of felt, oh great, now I, now I have a mother. You know, it's Franklin's mother will be kind of like my mother. And Sarah had the attitude of, well, I've already raised the perfect child, um, you know, Franklin. Um, I don't need to raise anybody else. And so they both kind of came to that relationship with, with different expectations. Eleanor kind of expecting Sarah to be sort of a mother figure to her and Sarah being very standoffish and not, you know, um, not, I shouldn't say that. She wasn't mean to Eleanor in any way, shape, or form, but she had no interest in being, in El being Eleanor's mother. So, uh, but Sarah took a big role in raising the children um, and basically, you know, sidelined Eleanor in that. And uh, it wasn't until the children got older that Eleanor really began to develop relationships, you know, with them. She was afraid of her children. She literally was afraid of her children because she didn't know anything about kids. You know, she didn't know anything about. And she grew up in a world of adults. She didn't have a good role model. Um, she was afraid of, of of her own children. So later on, they got they got to be um, um, closer. And um, you know, she uh, Franklin didn't help matters because he was the typical dad of that era, where you know you come in, you roll around on the floor with them, and get them all riled up and everything. And then, you know, when they start breaking stuff, step aside and the mother has to come in and say, now you kids, light, you know, not lighten up and knock it off. Um, so she was, um, she was not a, you know, a particularly strong or good, or, you know, I wouldn't say good, but she just, she didn't, the role of being mother did not come easy to her until later on when she had the, um, you know, when the kids were older and such. Um, she was probably, uh, as often happens, you know, much more comfortable with her grandchildren than she was with her own children. Um, because by then she had kind of picked things up and such. Um, but she was very, very good with um, college-age kids. And in fact, uh, one of her best friends was a guy by the name of Joe Lash. And Joe Lash was, um, was a college kid who she had met through one of the you know, youth organizations and such. And they bonded and became good buds. And um, they, uh, you know, the kids would come to visit the house and they'd have to sleep on the couch because Joe Lash was in the guest room, you know, and, and you know, there's that kind of thing. And um, they remained friends for, for the rest of their lives. Uh, in fact, when she died in six, 1962, she had a picture of Joe Lash in her wallet. Um, you know, he was, he was that instrumental and, and important to her. So, um, and then some of the kids have written books, um, you know, uh, the one I would probably recommend is Grand Mayor, which was actually written by um, David Roosevelt, who was a grandson, mm -hmm. and that tells you, I think you get a, better, a little bit better insight into Mrs. Roosevelt feeling comfortable and more comfortable in the role of, law, of mother uh, uh, at, that, at that point. And the children had issues because, you know, I wouldn't say issues, but the children had it rough because your mother's Eleanor Roosevelt, mm -hmm. your father is Franklin Roosevelt. Right, those are big shoes to fill. I often think how easy it is for my kids. You know, <laughs> they can just keep from being arrested before they're 16. Uh, they're going to be, they're going to be okay. So, and and when people came to the children, they they could never really tell if they're coming to me as Franklin or John or you know, um, you know, or Anna, or are you coming to me as the son of Franklin Roosevelt or the you know daughter of, of Eleanor Roosevelt? Yes, ma'am. I was going to mention. Um, David, that he lived right in this area on Old Summit for a couple of years, yep. and his children, his daughters, went to Dutch Day. Yep, yep. And, and now he lives in Hyde Park, okay. and they're going right in, the, in right. the Red House. Yes. Yep. And they um they go to to uh, they go to Red Hook, oh. Red Hook School. So there's uh, you know the great grandchildren of Franklin Roosevelt still here in the you know in the valley. Um, when did she stop writing My Day? About 20 minutes before she 
kicked. She, wow. she wrote it right up to the end, just a couple of weeks before she... Started. <clears throat> yeah, that's when it became like really kind of a My Day column. She had written... Yeah, she had written some stuff before, but it wasn't really the My Day stuff until, um, until you know, she became First Lady. Um, and, and everybody wanted, um, well, she, well, it's interesting, she didn't want to be the traditional presidential wife. You know, she, by the time he became president, um, she had finally begun to develop a personality and a career of her own, and she was expected to turn all that away, and she didn't want to do that. So she very cleverly crafted her own way into the, um, into the, into the, the first ladyship. And a lot of people say that she changed the role of first lady. And I don't agree with that. I don't believe that. Um, I think she stretched it to her own personality. And when she was no longer there, I think it shrunk back down to what it had been. You know, Mrs. Roosevelt was involved in, you know, civil rights, women's rights, you know, workers' rights, um, you know, you name it. She, you know, human rights. She was involved in all that stuff, and when you think, and this is by no reason or means to be a criticism of first ladies, but if you think of the first ladies that came after that, you know, what did Mamie do? Yeah, what? Yeah, right. Mamie did nothing, right? Um, you know, you know. Serve tea at the White House. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Uh, and what does that mean? Serve tea. Oh, Thursday we're going to have a tea. Somebody make it, and we'll you know get the people invited. But then later on, like you know, Jackie Kennedy, you know, took over the idea of you know saving the the treasures in the White House. And, um, you know, um, Lady Bird Johnson was highway beautification, and, you know, Michelle Obama was um, nutrition, and Laura Bush was, um, you know, um, Reading. Uh, literacy. Reading. Right. So they did have, you know, and, but, but think about that. You know, I just wrapped off five or six things Mrs. Roosevelt did, and the rest of these folks are famous for, for one thing. You know, so I don't think she changed the first lady's role. I think she, she stretched it out and made it comfortable for her to be there. And, um, and, and in some ways, by doing that, um, you know, that's how she was able to survive. Because I think she would have been um, crushed if she hadn't done that. And if she hadn't been able to find her way to work through that, I think she would have been um, really, really in deep trouble. Because um, she had spent her whole life like that and finally blossomed a bit and wasn't going to be put back in the, in the bottle. And to his credit, President Roosevelt let her do that. You know, he understood how important it was. And not only that, he then played it to his advantage by using her as a sounding board and, um, you know, and for advice and, and that sort of thing. Because he knew that she knew more about it. She was, she was way more, um, and I don't mean to criticize the president, but she was way more genuine than he was. You know, he understood in the abstract, oh yeah, people live in poverty and all that. She was out there with people living in poverty. You know, when she was working in the tenement houses and those kinds of things. You know, and she took him when they were dating, right? Now here's, you know, this is, you know, how's this for fancy? Um, you, know, you want to go on a date? Sure. Where do you want to go? How about I take you to the tenement houses? Uh -oh. And we can see how people are living, right? He couldn't believe people were living like that. You know, he knew it. You know, he knew it intellectually. But he couldn't believe that people were living that way. And, you know, she walks in and she feels relatively, you know, at home because, um, you know, obviously she was a woman of means, but she understood that, that, that you know, she had emotional needs and was emotionally lacking. They were financially lacking. Um, but she understood that, that empty spot that needed to be filled. He never had an empty spot. His mother kept that very filled with affection and, you know, um, you know, money. Being, you know, money and being spoiled, you know, basically. Yeah, yeah, you know. Anybody else? So if you know somebody that has a Roosevelt story like this guy, okay, hopefully a little more uplifting than the cartoon. <laughs> yeah. And actually, we have to get out of here because you got to go home and watch SpongeBob, right? <laughs> um, and I'm just teasing with you. Um, but uh, but don't you kind of kick yourself now? And wish you knew what she had said. And... But we were seven or eight yeah. years old. Yeah. And we had no right. idea. We had never even heard of her. Wow. The uh, upper class people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. we are high school kids. We're just on ourselves. Right. And the stupid yeah. magicians yeah. and cartoonists. But that's, well, she was a magician, right? She made a lot of hate and, you know, racism go away. Um, but that's, you know, but that's important to expose young people to that, to that kind of stuff. You don't always have to understand it at the time. 
but it'll happen um, along the way. So I do apologize if I disappointed you by not having more, you know, fun and frolicky um, Millbrook oh, stories, so but um, we don't really have a whole lot of record of them over there, um, other than the stuff that went on with the, with the Millbrook School. So if you guys know people that have it, let's capture that and we'll, we'll begin to, to put a collection together. Yes, ma'am. This is um, not fun. This is not really Millbrook rooted, but I read maybe it was in Harry Belafonte's book or something like that. Um, I think it was his book that he came up to visit Mrs. Have you heard this? That he came up to visit Mrs. Roosevelt, and they were involved with NAACP and the mm -hmm. Civil Rights Movement. And uh, apparently, um, either he or she had a red sports car, yep. and she wanted to drive it. He said she was the worst driver he'd ever driven with and couldn't wait to get out of the car with Mrs. Roosevelt. Was yeah. it his car or hers? Um, it was his car, I his believe. Car. And she, she was a very bad driver. Um, <laughs> The story goes, you know, if you go to the museum, you see the president's car down the stairs, yeah. and there's some dings and scratches on it and such. Um, she drove it after he died. They reworked it to be a regular car again. They didn't have the, the leg, you know, the levers and things because he couldn't use his legs. And the argument, or the story is that the dings and scratches were all put on there in the two years that she drove it. And then there's another story about one time that they were having dinner, and. Uh, the kids, you know, they were being teenagers, and they started ranking on, um, you know, Mrs. Roosevelt's driving. Come on, you're such a bad driver, blah, blah, blah. You know, they go back and forth, and they didn't let up. And she burst into tears and ran off. Um, and FDR allegedly slammed his hand down on the table and said, Children, you must never make fun of your mother's driving when she's in the room ever again. <laughs> so, so they knew, but, you know, he didn't want her, them rubbing it in that way. Anything else? Okay, so please take some seats.